introduction, um, and my thanks to Dell and all of his very professional colleagues for pulling this uh, wonderful event together. You lured me back from Munich, and that was not easy. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of chance to hang out in that city, um, but I could not refuse the opportunity to be here, and I've already seen so many interesting papers that I've talked to Dell about the possibility of considering some of these as, as a special issue in the journal for the study of religion, nature, and culture that I edit. So obviously, it's been a rich intellectual day for me personally, and more from uh, both the graduate students and faculty here as time goes forward, and hopefully look at these at more of these articles. Um, I like when I do field work and do my scholarship to try to give people not just a kind of cognitive sense of what's going on, but to give people a visceral feel for the social movements that, that I study. And one of the ways I do that is through the arts and the music, the, the sort of ritual and uh, artistic productivity that often comes with these movements. So you'll get some of that tonight. And hopefully, uh, I've given this a little bit of a, a new spin, and uh, hopefully the technology will work. I've got uh, paper here in case it doesn't. And uh, there was a, a little bit of an echo in a video that I'm going to play for you, and I think we're going to go uh, with uh, just holding the mic up to the little speaker here so that we don't get that echo. But I think you'll get the gist of it when we get to that part of the talk. So, when he published on the origin of species in 1859, Charles Darwin knew the profound disruptions to conventional faith that his work would have. After all, his wife was a devout Christian who was very concerned about her husband's eternal fate, as he had left behind his belief in God. Not wanting to leave readers with a loss of meaning and the emotional turmoil that that involves, he wrote these words at the end of his revolutionary book. It is interesting to contemplate an entangled bank, clothed with many plants of many kinds, with birds singing on the, in the bushes, with various insects flitting about, and with worms crawling through the damp earth, and to reflect that these elaborately constructed forms, so different from one another and dependent on each other in so complex a manner, have been produced by laws acting all around us. Thus, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher animals, directly follows. There is grandeur in this view of life. From so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. I begin my talk with Darwin's offer of an alternative meaning system to set up these questions for our consideration tonight. If you were around when the prophets and gurus were teaching, would you have predicted their followers would become the world's predominant religions? In his talk this afternoon, Gordon Melton pointed out that even 100 years after uh, Jesus was on the earth, there were probably only about 10 centers where there were significant numbers of Christians anywhere. So that's certainly a big kind of softball thrown right over the plate for my talk tonight. If there was a new global religious movement unfolding today that would become one of, if not the most prevalent spiritual movement in the world, would you see and recognize it? There may be such a movement emerging, and tonight I'd like to give you the lenses to possibly see it. I call it dark green religion. Uh, what I'd like to do tonight is just to start with some stories, since we're storytelling creatures from long, long ago. We don't quite have a campfire here, but we'll do our best. In 1985, the Australian philosopher and eco-feminist Val Plumwood was canoeing in the Canyon wetlands. One of the world's most dangerous animals, a saltwater salt water crocodile approached and then suddenly rammed her canoe. Plumwood steered to the slippery and muddy riverbank, hoping that she might escape by jumping from uh, from jumping from the canoe and pulling herself up by the lower branches of a tree. As she prepared to leap, she recalled, the crocodile rushed up alongside the canoe and its beautiful golden eyes looked straight into mine. If this were a vision of communion, it was unwelcome. 
Just as she left for safety, the crocodile burst from the water, clamped down on her legs and spun, rolling her several times underwater. The philosopher fought back and somehow managed to free herself and scramble out of the crocodile's range. Plumwood survived severe injuries and despite a long, painful recuperation, later reported a golden glow over her life as a result of the experience. She added that afterward, for the first time, she understood that she was prey, a part of the food chain. The experience helped her to break past her sense of superiority to and separateness from nature. You could say that the crocodile taught the philosopher a lesson. On the 22nd of December 2005, William C. Rogers pulled a plastic bag over his head and asphyxiated himself. He had been arrested 17 days earlier, suspected of involvement in the Earth Liberation Front, a radical environmental group that was responsible for setting a series of fires and causing millions of dollars of damages, of damage at logging companies, forest service offices, and genetic engineering research facilities, and SUV dealerships. The targets were scattered across the western U.S. and included a 1998 fire at an exclusive lodge that was under construction at a Vail, Colorado ski resort. The arsonists hoped to force the resort to reverse its decision to expand into an area that biologists had designated as critical habitat for the endangered lynx. Before his suicide, Rogers learned that he had been betrayed by several of those once in his ELF cell. Charged under terrorism statutes and facing life in prison, he left these words for his comrades. Certain human cultures have been waging war against the earth for millennia. I chose to fight on the side of the bears, mountain lions, skunks, saguaros, and all things wild. I'm just the most recent casualty in that war, but tonight I've made a jailbreak. I'm returning home to the earth, to the place of my origins. Now I'll just give you a little global whiplash. In April 2008, I picked up a copy of Time magazine in Freiburg, Germany with the cover story, How to Win the War on Global Warming. Inside was an advertisement by a Japanese electronics company proclaiming, Sanyo is at the forefront of making clean energy an everyday reality. Rare is the corporation that devotes its resources to making the world and the future a better place. But with its Think Gaia corporate philosophy, Sanyo leads the way with a unique vision for dealing with energy and environmental issues. Samuel then traced its philosophy to the Gaia hypothesis as presented by the atmospheric scientist James Lovelock, who contends that the biosphere should be understood as a self-regulating organism that maintains the conditions necessary for the planet's diverse species. Samuel noted that Lovelock used Gaia, the goddess mother of Greek mythology, to describe the Earth as an organism, and then added, Samuel is striving to create the products needed to help us listen to Gaia's voice and live in harmony with the planet. The final section of the text even decried materialism and advanced the idea that people must symbiotically co-evolve with all life, pursuing sustainable solutions to ensure positive coexistence with Gaia. In 1997, the Dutch philosopher Franz Lanting published a huge coffee table book entitled Eye to Eye, Intimate Encounters with the Animal World which was replete with stunning photographs of animal eyes. This and the next couple of pictures are from the book. In his narrative introduction, Lanting explained how, as a youth in Holland, he read a novel by the Nobel Prize winning Swedish uh, author Selma Lagerlöf. Titled The Wonderful World of Nils, the story is about a boy who shrinks to the size of an elf and spent a year living with a family of geese, learned to see the world through their eyes, and became an advocate for them after returning to the human world. Lanting then described his career as a photographic conservationist, stating that while sometimes through his own work, like Nils, he had come to see the world through other eyes, he added that this book was designed to celebrate the kinship of all life. These pictures of bird eyes are from the posters of two ornithological conferences, one in Brazil, the second in the US, the latter of which I attended in 2008. It was organized by the International Partners in Flight, which is devoted to bird conservation in the Americas. 
Ornithologists, environmental managers, and citizens concerned about declining bird populations came from throughout the Americas. One evening, a session was held that was designed to celebrate birds and their power to transform consciousness and reshape human imagination. The presentation mixed poem stories and poems, stories, and myths with bird sounds and human music, as well as with stunning photographs of bird eyes to, and I quote, remind us that we need birds as much as they need us and to inspire new ideas to awaken the connections between humans and the universe. In January 2008, I visited the National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City. Its most prominent exhibit introduced the discipline of anthropology. The first panel explained the age of the Earth. The second described the evolutionary process. The third included these words. Thus, anthropology, through the study of fossil remains and modern primates, can trace the evolutionary relationships, presenting a mirror that reminds us that we are part of the history of the world and the animal kingdom, and not, as we had believed, that we were created to have nature at our service. Underscoring the connection between human beings and the rest of the animal kingdom was a nearby display of Australopithecus afarensis, an early bipedal hominid who scientists consider a human ancestor. Here and elsewhere, the museum curators articulated the view that humans and animals and all uh, organisms share a common ancestor. This was the basis as well for the exhibit's explicit criticism of anthropocentric or human-centered arrogance and the false earlier view that nature was created only for humans. The perceptive visitor would recognize that colonial, Abrahamic, and by that I mean Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the, the major Western religions that trace their lineage to the prophet Abraham, the perceptive visitor would recognize that these colonial Abrahamic religions were being criticized for promoting precisely such a, a destructive misperception. The idea and value of traditional ecological knowledge was explained and its interrelatedness with the pagan nature spirituality that yet survives in Mesoamerican indigenous communities was acknowledged and portrayed sympathetically. The museum thus blended contemporary biocultural understandings, national pride, and subtle anti-colonial and anti-theist attitudes. Put briefly, the museum celebrated the spiritual connections human beings once had and could have again with nature in Mesoamerica. Throughout the rest of the museum, other themes typical of dark green religion were expressed, including links between the domestication of plant and animal species, human overpopulation, deforestation, declining ecosystem diversity, declining resilience and agricultural productivity, famine, warfare, and social and environmental collapse. In 2005, UNESCO, the United Nations educational and scientific organization approved a proposal to establish a Cape Horn Biosphere Reserve in the Antarctic province of Chile, right on the Beagle Channel, named for the ship upon which Darwin sailed on his most important voyage. I was a member of an international research group to attend the dedication of the Amora Ethnobotanical Park. Our delegation was led by Ricardo Rossi, he's on the left side of your screen, uh, a Chilean ecologist who advocates fully integrating the traditional ecological knowledge of indigenous peoples into all biosphere reserve projects. During the dedication, I watched as officials involved with biosphere reserve programs from around the world, Chilean politicians, military officers, scientists, philosophers, community members, all visited the park's so-called miniature forest. The term forest in this context referred to the scores of lichens, mosses, and liver, liverworts endemic to the region. That this was a biodiversity hotspot was emphasized. And these organisms were featured through stations established with symbolic large magnifying glasses, without glass, which directed attention to specific species and the adjacent names for them. The visitors also used real magnifying glasses and small flashlights to see these beautiful and bizarre life forms. As the people examined the lichens, and I examined the people examining the lichens, 
It occurred to me that the way the park's interpreters had set up the viewing stations resembled a ritual, which of course focuses attention on that which is considered sacred. The guides and visitors expressed delight at what they were seeing, and the overall tone of the gathering seemed to be reverence for these diminutive life forms. Here's a few pictures of these organisms. Well, we're in Florida. This is a good one to show, I think. In June 2006, I was wandering by a bookshop in Istanbul, of all places, quite inland, and I noticed a prominently displayed book about surfing. Intrigued, I went in and found out that the book was originally published in German, and it began with the claim that surfing has a spiritual aura that you only get once you've experienced the magic that envelops you when surfing. Any surfers out there? You know what he's talking about? A decade earlier, with sunny skies and the surf pounding in San Diego, I skipped the morning session of an academic conference and was soon chatting with a young woman at a surf shop, deciding which board to rent. When she learned I was formerly an ocean lifeguard from the region, then living inland, she exclaimed, whoa, dude. No amount of money is worth living away from Mother Ocean. Little did she know how little university professors made. <laughs> Nearly a decade later, my scholarly articles about surfing as a nature religion created a mini sensation. The world's most widely distributed surfing magazine scrambled to excerpt and reflect on my analysis, which many surfers felt accurately described their own connections to nature, such as expressed in this statement by the professional surfer Rob Machado. If we had more time, I'd play the video that's associated with this from the film Five Summer Stories. Oh, there's the Machado quote. But you see, he's stressing that uh, he has a relationship with Mother Ocean. Last story, I think. Late one night in 2000, I sat with five others around the fire well outside of the protective enclosure at the Masuku Nature Preserve in southwestern uh, Botswana. Our group had been participating in the Deep Ecology Elephant Program, a form of ecotourism invented by Chris Vandermeer, a photojournalist of Afrikaner heritage, from Pretoria, South Africa. It was our last night at the reserve, sitting in what Vandermeer dubbed a vigil. We thought of the leopards that inhabited the trees like the ones overhead, recalling that the largest males weigh nearly 200 pounds and carry prey three times their size into those trees. On occasion, that prey is human. During the days prior to this concluding rite, we walked the plains rather than viewing the land from the safety of a safari vehicle. Vandermeer wanted us to feel what it was like to be a member of the species Homo sapiens, living as a part of the wider community of life in Africa, with all of its corresponding vulnerabilities. The Deep was premised on Vandermeer's belief of, in the entwined destiny of humans and the rest of the living community. For Vandermeer, elephants were good teachers, at least indirectly through their human-like behavior, and possibly even telepathically. For his part, Vandermeer believed that by showing the similarities between humans and elephants, by walking the plains, and by sitting outside the protected enclosure at night, we might better understand that we are a part of nature. He hoped this injunction would promote biodiversity conservation. In 1990, a group of famous scientists, including Stephen Jay Gould, Peter Raven, Carl Sagan, and Stephen Schneider, alarmed by accumulating evidence of severe anthropogenic environmental decline, issued this pronouncement on the screen there. As scientists, many of us have had profound personal experiences of awe and reverence before the universe. We understand that what is regarded as sacred is more likely to be treated with care and respect. Our planetary home should be so regarded. Efforts to safeguard and cherish the environment should be infused with a vision of the sacred. Despite the religious terminology, none of the signatories believed in the existence of non-material divine beings. Well, that's a bit of a global tour of some interesting social phenomena. And I think that despite the diversity of places and case studies, that there are important affinities in these otherwise very diverse social phenomena. 
In Dark Green Religion, I explore such phenomena in depth. Early in the book, I distinguish between green religion and dark green religion. Green religion I use as a broad umbrella term for any form of religious environmentalism. The best known examples are efforts by some practitioners and scholars of the world's largest and most influential traditions to explicate and develop their traditions, environmental ethics, and practices. Such religion contends that acting in environmentally friendly ways is a religious obligation. In my book, I discuss criticisms of the indifference or hostility to nature that is common in many religious traditions and how these criticisms have precipitated environmentally friendly trends as well. These are certainly important developments worth the scholarly attention devoted to them, including in the encyclopedia that Christian kindly mentioned. Uh, but such religious environmentalism is not my focus today. While by green religion, I mean all religions that believe in some way that environmental protection is a religious duty. By dark green religion, I refer to beliefs and practices in which nature itself is considered sacred and is having intrinsic value. Such spirituality is accompanied generally speaking, by feelings of kinship, humility, mutual dependence, and belonging. This slide provides the traits common in dark green religion. Nature is sacred. All things have intrinsic value. Uh, in environmental ethics jargon, we might call this deep ecological or biocentric <coughs> ethics. All life forms share a common ancestor and thus are literally kin, and just as we have ethical obligations to our kin in, among humans. According to this kind of spirituality, we also have corresponding moral obligations to, more, to our more distant cousins of other species. Uh, dark green religion generally draws on ecology-based metaphysics of interconnection and mutual dependence. And there's usually strong feelings of uh, belonging and connection to nature. Now, in my book, I explore the intellectual roots and diverse expressions of dark green spirituality within the environmentalist milieu, namely the increasing international venues where environmentally con uh, concerned individuals, movements, and individuals interact and influence one another. The environmental milieu is a bricolage, an amalgamation of bits and pieces of nature-related ideas and practices that are drawn from a variety of environmentally engaged social actors around the world. It may not be obvious that all of these in the preceding stories consider nature sacred and as having inherent worth, or even that these are religious phenomena. So let me elaborate. Uh, in his opening remarks today, we talk, uh, Christian talked a little bit about the contention over what the definitions of religion uh, are. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that tonight, but I am going to say that, uh, let you know what my basic approach is. I take what a number of scholars today uh, call a family resemblance approach to the study of uh, social phenomena. With a family resemblance approach, we do not assume that any single trait that's typically associated with religion constitutes its essence, that you must have this thing or you don't have religion. So the heart of such an approach is, first of all, to note that religious beliefs and practices have many dimensions and characteristics. Secondly, to reject the presumption that any single trait or characteristic is essential to religious phenomena, and to refrain from preoccupation with where the boundaries of religion lie. Frankly, I'm not smart enough to figure out where that is. And thirdly, to focus instead on whether any analysis of religion resembling beliefs and practices has explanatory power. I also find the early roots of the word religion helpful. Uh, one of the earliest roots is gets at the idea of to be bound to or connected to whatever one considers sacred. Uh, in other words, that what is sacred, what is sacred is that which is ultimately valuable, uh, that involves experiences of transformation, uh, of healing, uh, of spiritual and healing power, and also sometimes uh, involves beliefs and perceptions of, of physical healing power. Now, Dark green religion is about belonging and connection to nature and about our absolute dependence on it. So it's not surprising that people would consider nature miraculous and sacred. And so with others taking the family resemblance approach, I seek to analyze human behavior for its religious dimensions without trying to determine ultimately its boundaries in order to, to illuminate the complex relationships between human beings 
and the environments that they inhabit. Diverse expressions of such nature spirituality can generally be found in animistic and Gaian forms. And these, in turn, can be conventionally religious, seeing the divinity or divinities in or giving rise to nature. Or they can be entirely naturalistic, where there are no non-material divine beings or forces involved. Taking this approach, I've, I've identified two main types of dark green religion that are spreading rapidly. Both of these types have two forms, supernaturalistic, in this sense conventionally religious, and naturalistic, which I think is an important form of uh, religion or spirituality, an increasingly important form. These types are depicted graphically in the table on the screen. Um, with spiritual animism, which you'll see there on the, the left side, the world is filled with spiritual, if not divine, intelligences with whom one can communicate and possibly even commune with. As is typical with animism, kinship ethics flow from it. But this kind of animism is conventionally religious. Uh, examples include many indigenous traditions around the world, but also others like the Nobel, uh, uh, the uh, Pulitzer Prize winning poet Gary Snyder and many involved in contemporary <coughs> paganism. Naturalistic animism, on the other hand, is based on the personal relationships that people have with non-human organisms or on ethology, namely the study of animal consciousness, emotions, and behavior. Examples of this kind of naturalistic animism include uh, ordinary people and their pets, uh, projecting uh, emotions onto them or reading emotions from them. Scientists like Jane Goodall and Mark Beckhoff who feel deep empathy with non-human beings by recognizing that they share many emotional traits with us. But I think Darwin provided the classic example of how this, felt, how this kind of understanding leads to felt kinship and a biocentric ethics. He once wrote, if we choose to let conjecture run wild, then animals, our fellow brethren in pain, diseases, death, suffering, and famine, they may partake of our origin in one common ancestor we may be all netted together. Here, Darwin perceived that a kinship ethic can be deduced from reflection on our common ancestor. All life is quite literally related, as well as awareness that we and other animals suffer and face similar challenges. Now, Gaian, turning to the right column, Gaian Earth religion understands the Earth as a living being or organism and also has more conventionally religious and supernaturalistic forms, as well as naturalistic forms. Gaian spirituality is the supernaturalistic form and involves beliefs that the universe is guided by some superordinate divine intelligence. Examples are diverse. They're found in all sorts of different religious experiences where people feel themselves one with the divine in nature somehow. Typical labels for such spirituality are pantheism, nature as a whole is divine, panentheism, uh, which I won't go into the technical definition tonight for time constraints, people involved, Baruch, Spinoza, uh, and liberal theologians for just a couple examples. Gaian naturalism, on the other hand, is agnostic about or disavows belief in some supernatural divine intelligence guiding the universe. But those promoting it nevertheless consider nature to be awesome and wonderful and life so rare and precious that they often rely on religious terminology to express their love and devotion to life and its mysteries. The American ecologist Alva Leopold, who influentially wrote during the first half of the 20th century, provides an example of a bridge between animistic naturalism and Gaian spirituality. His own thinking and perceptions cohered with both. How many of you have you heard of Alva Leopold? I'm always interested to see how uh, broadly his influence is, is uh, spreading. Leopold even explicitly stated that the monotheistic Abrahamic religions fostered environmentally destructive behaviors, arguing that we need a dramatic change both intellectually and emotionally, and in our philosophy and religion, if we're to develop environmental sensibilities that are needed for conservation. You might today, say, our need for environmental sustainability. That seems to be the fashionable way to talk about similar things. Now, something akin to animism was needed to replace the, animus, the Abrahamic religions, Leopold thought, 
if humanity was to find its way to an ecologically friendly future. Leopold's own naturalistic animism is clearly reflected in story, uh, and this story, famous to many environmentalists, of his epiphany regarding the intrinsic value of a wolf, a species that he once sought to exterminate with both gun and pen. And this story, indeed, has become a well-known sacred story to, to many greens. What is striking for our immediate purpose is that he had this epiphany when looking directly into the eyes of a female wolf and that he and his, com that he and his comrades had just shot, just as the green fire died in her eyes. As Leopold recalled, and I abbreviate what you have on the screen a bit here, we were eating lunch on a high rim rock when we saw a wolf below fording the river, followed by a half dozen playful pups. In those days, we had never heard of passing up a chance to kill a wolf. In a second, we were pumping lead into the pack, but with more excitement than accuracy. When our rifles were empty, the old wolf was down and a pup was dragging a leg into impassable side rocks. We reached the old wolf in time to watch the green fire dying in her eyes. I realized then, and have known ever since, that there was something new to me in those eyes, something known only to her and to the mountain. I was young then and full of trigger itch. I thought that because fewer wolves meant more deer, that no wolves would mean a hunter's paradise. But after seeing the green fire die, I sensed that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view. With more time, I can recount many examples where someone experienced connection, understanding, and communion with a non-human organism when looking into its eyes, sometimes when watching them die, usually with the outcome of life of environmental or animal rights activism. For Leopold, however, the epiphany involved more than appreciating the value of an individual animal or even of its species. It contributed decisively to his ethical holism, which was influenced also by a complex mix of scientific understanding, long observation of nature's cycles, and the holistic and pantheistic metaphysics of a Russian mystical philosopher. In short, Leopold embraced the organic tradition in a way that considered the natural world sacred, but that was also updated by the ecological science prevalent in his day. As he wrote in one of his most evocative essays, the land is one organism. If we understand the whole is good, then every part is good, whether we understand it or not. In our intuitive perceptions, we realize the indivisibility of the earth its soil, mountains, rivers, forests, climate, plants, and animals, and respect it collectively, not only as a useful servant, but as a living being. Like Darwin himself and many others involved in what I call dark green religion, Leopold recognized that all life shares a common ancestor and came to be through what he evocatively called the odyssey of evolution. This, in turn, led to his own sense of kinship with his fellow creatures, his wish to live and let live, and a feeling of awe and wonder, as he wrote here, over the magnitude and duration of the biotic enterprise. As his primary philosopher, Kurt Meining, discovered, Leopold believed there was a mystical supreme power that guided the universe. But to him, this power was not a personalized god, but akin to the laws of nature. His son put it simply, I think he, like many of us, was a kind of pantheist. Leopold thus provides an example of someone who, like the philosopher who looked the crocodile in the eye before battling it for her life, was taught a lesson by an animal. They were both naturalistic animists in the terminology of my own analysis, and Leopold himself recognized that there was something new in his own worldview that had affin uh, affinity with animism, and that he considered this salutary. And also, through his holistic view of the biosphere's ecological systems, Leopold expressed his own kind of Gaian spirituality. Now, we first encountered James Lovelock as the scientist who inspired Sanyo's Think Gaia philosophy. How many of you have heard of James Lovelock and the Gaia hypothesis? OK. Uh, about the same as Leopold. As a purely scientific form of organicism, the Gaia hypothesis well represents what I'm calling Gaian naturalism. Lovelock was surprised, however, after publishing a book about his theory in 1979, that most of the mail he received expressed enthusiasm for Gaia as a spiritual system or being. 
These correspondents fit more the guy in spirituality trope than does Lovelock, who eschews metaphysical speculation and remains an exemplar of guy in naturalism. Nevertheless, Lovelock appreciates those who refer to the guy in system in explicitly religious terms, seeing them as allies in the effort to protect the guy in system. Whether naturalistic or not, all four forms of dark green religion express spiritualities of belonging and connection to nature, metaphysics and ecologies of interconnection and mutual dependence of natural systems, which are then considered sacred in some way and linked to biocentric kinship ethics. In my book, I provide many examples beyond the stories presented at the outset of today's presentation, including in literature, poetry, music, film, photography, scholarly writing, documentaries, and under the United Nations umbrella within environmental organizations, no surprise there, and even at theme parks, yes, theme parks. This is, for example, an artistic rendering of the Tree of Life sculpture at Disney's uh, Wild Animal Kingdom theme park, uh, which with diverse life forms embedded in its trunk and branches teaches in ecological interdependence and promotes kinship feelings. Since uh, Jane Goodall came up earlier in a talk today, I'll mention that when she toured the park shortly before it opened, she said, there's no chimpanzee here. And when she came back the next morning, they had chiseled a chimpanzee, her favorite, by the way, graybeard, right into the tree, which you can see yourself when you visit. Avatar, the motion picture, of course, is another artistic example of dark green religion that is a powerful, uh, quite arguably, because it reaches us at a deep emotional level where we know that we will flourish in biologically intact ecosystems. And there's a whole, the biophilia hypothesis by E.O. Wilson and Stephen Keller and their uh, colleagues is an expression of this, of this kind of, uh, I think, plausible hypothesis. And if you're interested, uh, a year from now, I'll have a book out on Avatar with a, a group of colleagues analyzing in all sorts of interesting ways. Another apt example is this poster disseminated by the Sierra Club, the environmental organization founded by the famous Scottish-American naturalist John Muir, which is now, of course, also internationally influential. Note in the image the birch-like human legs entwined with the surrounding trees symbolically uh, resembling interconnection and kinship, a kind of shape-shifting, uh, providing an echo of the kinds of shamanistic cultures in which humans shape-shift between human and non-human forms. You can, uh, I've put some of the, the text out there on, on the, the side there. This is not about getting back to nature, it's about understanding that we've never left. This connection is fundamental, as personal as it is fundamental, you either feel it or you don't, Sierra Club members feel it, of course. <laughs> we're deep in our nature every day. We're up to our ears in it. It's under our feet. It's in our lungs. It runs through our veins. We're not visitors here. We were born here, and we're part of it. When you accept your connection to nature, suddenly you can't look at the work without seeing something very personal in it. You work for the planet because you belong to it. Is there anything spiritual or religious about that poster? It's an officially approved Sierra Club poster, by the way. Now, uh, if we had more time, um, I could take you to the welcome ceremony of the World Summit on Sustainable Development. I can economize on time tonight by not doing that because I put this on YouTube and some of the stuff I'm going to uh, provide for you tonight and more is at my website under the dark green religion uh, area. And you can find a link to the, this uh, really spectacular pageant that was performed at the beginning of the World Summit. In a nutshell, I'll just briefly describe it. Here's uh, the, uh, at the beginning, all the dignitaries are there at the beginning of the World Summit on Sustainable Development in 2002. And they have this fabulous pageant. Uh, now, of course, there's a fine line between performance, pageantry, and ritual. So to my mind, this was a ritual resembling pageant that was paid for and orchestrated by uh, United Nations officials. Um, it had a kind of uh, almost to be expected cosmogony about how the world used to be a paradise. There was a fall from that paradise through greed um, and so forth. Uh, so here's the plaintiff's child wondering, you know, where did everything go bad? Um, there's a, there was the segments where um, the origin story of, of life on Earth, uh, 
when people and animals lived closely together and were uh, living in close uh, relationship and harmony, the world grooving in Edenic harmony. You really should listen to this video, it's fabulous. And uh, uh, then, of course, scenes of ecological apocalypse follow, uh, looking at all of the, the environmental problems we have today as it kind of screens through this thing. And then, toward the end of the pageant, uh, like most religious apocalypticism, nevertheless, hope is offered. And what's the hope in this story, in this narrative? Well, the hope is that the children of the world, anyway, will call the nations to uh, begin to act responsibly and to respond to this environmental and social crisis. So that was the, the story of the welcome uh, ceremony. Uh, Incidentally, the nation states didn't do much to Johannesburg uh, to promote sustainability, so maybe the, the real power brokers weren't there or didn't get the message. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, the pageant was, uh, was trying to spur them forward. Uh, we could also talk about figures like Nango Tiango or people with the, the Green Belt movement. I have a wonderful interview online with him. He was a, a Green Belt, is a Green Belt uh, attorney and the interesting ways in which uh, he is an expression of globalization, where he, he uh, is a Christian, but he has a, a kind of African uh, spirituality uh, in which the mountain is sacred and the plants and animals are sacred, so it's a kind of hybridized Western Christianity with African Christianity, and then that's in turn hybridized with, an, with a contemporary anthropological understanding of traditional ecological knowledge and how they have to go back to some of their roots and find out the ways that people lived in more sustainable ways before colonialism. And so there's also the anti-colonial critique. So this is part of what we find under this kind of uh, environmental milieu, this global environmental milieu, where people are encountering one another because of the, of the crisis. And just as happens whenever cultures encounter one another, uh, sometimes bad things happen, sometimes th good things happen. But people are always curious about one another, and they're interested in borrowing uh, the cool stuff that other people know and deploying that in their own lives to be, uh, to, have, to be happier and more prosperous. And so that's a part of what's going on. And you can see the way in which this gentleman is using these different forms of knowledges. Uh, very interesting uh, phenomena of globalization, I think. Now I will take time before closing uh, to provide two clips from the creative music videos that are produced by John Boswell, which provide a wonderful example of what I'm calling dark green religion. You could even think about these things online as forms of online ritualizing. Uh, the video includes three, the first one includes three prominent proponents of such spirituality, whom I discuss in my book, Carl Sagan, uh, David Attenborough, and Jane Goodall. Um, I'm gonna show you two, two different videos. The first one stresses the, the, the theme of, uh, uh, of interconnection. Um, the second, underscores the reverence for the universe and all life that I think uh, arguably must become widespread if our species uh, is to flourish here long term. So here's where I'm going to bend this thing down. And this may not be perfect. All this, this music is also, there's links to this music uh, and these videos online too. So if you can't make out everything, I apologize. connected to each other biologically, to the earth chemically, to the rest of the universe atomically. I think nature's imagination is so much greater than man, he's never gonna let us relax, relax, relax. We live in an in-between universe where things change all right, but according to patterns, rules, or as we call them, laws of nature. I'm this guy standing on a planet. Really, I'm just a speck. I'm just a speck compared with a star. The planet is just another speck. To think about all of this. To think about the vast emptiness of space. There's billions and billions of stars. Billions and billions of specks. The beauty of a living thing is not the atoms that go into it, but the way those atoms are put together. 
cosmos is also within us. We're made of sparks, but we are away of the cosmos and know itself. Across the sea of space, the stars are other sun. We have traveled this way before, and there is much to be learned. We're all connected to each other biologically, to the Earth chemically, to the rest of the universe atomically. I find it elevating and exhilarating to discover that we live in a universe which permits the evolution of molecular machines as intricate and subtle as we. molecules in my body are traceable to phenomena in the cosmos. That makes me want to grab people in the street and say, have you heard this? The beauty of a living thing is not the atoms that go into it, but the way those atoms are put together. The cosmos is also within us. We're made of sparks stuff. We are away of the cosmos and know itself. There's this tremendous mass of waves all over in space, which is the light bouncing around the room, going from one thing to the other, and it's all really there, really, really there. But you gotta stop and think about it, about the complexity, and really get the pleasure. It's all really there, really, really there. The inconceivable nature of nature. To think about all of this To think about the vast emptiness of space There's billions and billions of stars Billions and billions of specks The beauty of a living thing is not the atoms that go into it But the way those atoms are put together The cosmos is also within us We're made of sparks stuff We are away of the cosmos and know itself across the sea of space. Okay, I know I'm just teasing you here, but you can, you can get the rest of that online. Now, after I discovered this video, I contacted John Boswell and we got to talking, um, and uh, I said that this, this particular video seemed to me like a, a great expression of what I've been researching and writing about. And I said, have you thought of doing something on Jane Goodall and, and David Attenborough? And he said, Wow, man, that's weird. Um, I'm just about to release one on, that includes Jane Goodall and David Attenborough. And so that's what I'm going to play for you now. Let's take a trip to examine this common basis of life, a voyage to investigate the molecular machinery at the heart of life on Earth. All life is related, and it enables us to construct with confidence the complex tree that represents the history of life. Our planet, the Earth, is, as far as we know, unique in the universe. It contains life. Here, plants and animals proliferate in such numbers that we still have not even named all the different species. Darwin's great insight revolutionized the way in which we see the world. We now understand why there are so many different species. Every cell is a triumph of natural selection, and we're made of trillions of cells in us. It's a little universe. Those are some of the things that molecules do. Given four billion years of evolution, we are, each of us, a multitude. Now, how did the molecules of life arise? It began in the sea some 3,000 million years ago. Complex chemical molecules began to clump together. These were the seeds from which the tree of life developed. They were able to split, replicating themselves as bacteria. 
The secrets of evolution are time and death. There's an unbroken thread that stretches from those first cells to us. The secrets of evolution are time and death. There's an unbroken thread that stretches from those first cells to us. Every cell is a triumph of natural selection, and we're made of trillions of cells in us as a little universe. Those are some of the things that molecules do. Given four billion years of evolution, we are each of us a multitude. It isn't the sharp line dividing humans from the rest of the animal kingdom. It's a very wuzzy line. It's a very wuzzy line. It's getting wuzzier all the time. We find animals doing things that we, in our arrogance, used to think was just human. It's a very wuzzy line, it's getting wuzzier all the time. Every cell is a triumph of natural selection, and we're made of trillions of cells in us as a little universe. Those are some of the things that molecules do. Given four billion years of evolution, we are each of us a multitude. Every cell is a triumph of natural selection, and we're made of trillions of cells in us as a little universe. Our planet, the Earth, is, as far as we know, unique in the universe. It contains life. Its continued survival now rests in our hands. So I probably should have introduced that a little bit better for those of you who don't know Jane Goodall, the woman who uh, demonstrated that chimpanzees have culture, as we defined culture at that time, that they were tool-making creatures. And David Attenborough, uh, the world's greatest uh, nature documentarian the, the, uh, with the BBC and uh, uh, for a generation has produced these fabulous nature documentaries. Um, incidentally, I sent the chapter uh, where I talk about Attenborough to him, and he had no objection to my spin on him as a, at least a quasi-religious uh, nature nut. <laughs> um, but you can ask yourself, I, I, with my students and, and, and colleagues, I, I sometimes point out that, that really in the last analysis we're all data. We should all be self-reflective about how what we are studying is affecting us and how that might affect our scholarship. And you can ask yourself sitting out in the, uh, in the room tonight. You can take yourself as data and maybe your friends later as data and ask yourself, is there anything in that kind of video that is evocative for you? What sorts of affective, emotional, or spiritual resonances does it have for you? Or conversely, um, does it uh, trouble you or make you fearful or scared or angry? And those are also some of the kinds of reactions that, that certain people will have to the kinds of uh, ideas expressed in that sort of video. Now I thought I'd just uh, bring you back to where we started tonight before we take a little time for some questions. Um, certainly with more time, I would, as I did in the book, argue that we might be seeing the early nascent stages of a civil earth religion which could provide an affective basis for the radical transformation of human societies that will be necessary if, we're, if we are to avert the unfolding global ecological and social catastrophe uh, and thus conserve the planet's precious biological and cultural diversity. Interestingly, when uh, another great scholar of uh, new religious movements, Bob Elwood, read, read the book, he said, um, the impression I had in reading the book is that you, we might well indeed be just as people were two, three, and sometimes 4,000 years ago uh, in the midst of an emerging new religious movement. We might indeed be just as they were in the so-called axial age of the world's religious uh, traditions emerging. We might be seeing the same sort of thing right now. And you can ask yourself, I mean, we had a number of scientific revolutions before, before Darwin, Copernicus, and so forth. 
But I would argue that, uh, that really everything began to change with Darwin. Um, it's a fu the, the Darwinian revolution is a fundamental challenge to religions that originated thousands of years ago. And wherever people are uh, reasonably well educated, that paradigm shift is well underway. And it is, when we see it in the demographic data in all sorts of different places, it's really having a profound impact. So part of the question for social scientists is what will be the near-term uh, impact uh, in terms of conventional religiosities, in terms of various forms of environmental action, in terms of environmental politics. But I think it's really valuable to not think like a historian and look only backwards, or not think like most social scientists do, which is within a, a, a fairly small time frame, a fairly small near-term time frame, but to think significantly further forward. When you think about how different people think today than they did 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, what are going to be the, uh, the predominant worldviews and understanding of the cosmos and the human place in it uh, three generations from now, uh, 200 years from now, 500 years from now, a millennia from now, two millennia from now, five millennia from now. And do you think that the religions that predominate today will be those predominating significantly further down the line? Or will there be some very different understanding uh, that maybe even is being birthed right now all around us if we have the lenses to see it? And so that's a part of my uh, suggestion for you tonight. Um, so I'll close just with returning to this slide where uh, you can ask yourself, is there some way for what Darwin was offering, I think to the world and perhaps also to his wife, that there's a grandeur in this view of life and that whilst this planet has gone cycling according to the fixed law of gravity from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. Are there ways to, der to derive a compelling spirituality, a meaningful worldview, and a compelling response to life's fragility through such an ecological and evolutionary worldview? I think that for some, as we've seen tonight, the answer is yes. So the subsequent question is how many of our own kind are finding a compelling worldview and spirituality in such naturalistic understandings of cosmological and biological evolution? Are these numbers increasing? Are they likely to? And are dark green spiritualities a big part of the planetary and religious future? I think with the right lenses, we can answer decisively, well, maybe. And time will tell. <laughs>